Hi everyone. We're gonna. Um, this is Raja Sivamani. I'm with Learn Skin, and I'm one of the faculty for the Integrative Dermatology Certificate Program. Um, this session is really meant to give you an overview of what we are trying to achieve with the IDCP. But it's not about us that are faculty. Really, we have people. Uh, we have other dermatologists that have taken the program, and I think it's more important that you hear from them just so that you get a flavor for how they experienced it and what they're doing with it. So. Um, that's what we'll be doing. Now, my name is Raja. I'm also um, one of the three faculty. We'll just do a quick introduction on our uh, on ourselves. But what we're going to cover is just what what is the definition of integrative dermatology and some of the resources that we have. We we'll give an overview to the program. We want to do a slight case based discussion so you get a flavor for what uh, the approaches that we take. But then uh, what we really want to get to is the panel discussion of the folks that have taken this program already. And we're, uh, we're very excited because every time we have people that come back and talk about things, like every single person that takes this program just becomes like a bigger and bigger family. And then we're just going to have more and more influence. So you can run, but integrative dermatology will find you somehow, uh, one way or another. So just about myself, I'm a, a board certified dermatologist. I'm also an Ayurvedic practitioner and um, I, I do have two practices that are focused on medical dermatology and also we have one that's more holistic, integrative and aesthetics, but we bring in integrative principles into all of them. And so, uh, I, and I do a lot of research. So this is an area where I'm very highly passionate and let me turn it over to Apple and Peter and I'll let them introduce themselves too. I'm, um... Apple Bodemer. I'm a dermatologist at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and um, I do a lot of teaching. I have residents that come through both in the Integrative Medicine Fellowship Program here at UW. I also do a lot of teaching through the university, through the Integrative um, Fellowship Program through University of Arizona, and I've kind of been in this world since um, since I finished my fellowship in 2007. <laughs> And I'm extremely passionate about it. I feel so lucky to have found Peter and Raja and Benita and the whole team. Um, and, you know, it's just a really fun group. And I echo what Raja says, like, once you do this, you're kind of family for life. We won't hunt you down and we won't follow you and, and pester you. But, but it does become like a big family of like like-minded healthcare providers. And it's really wonderful to see this community keep growing. So I'll turn it over to you, Peter. I concur completely, 100%. I'm Peter Leo. I've been practicing um, integrative dermatology for at least about a decade. I've been kind of interested in it and maybe longer because right when I finished residency, I did a year of acupuncture, but no doubt it took me a little time to kind of figure out how I was going to bring things together. And little by little, I've been able to refine things and learn more stuff and work on different projects. And it's been so great meeting kindred spirits, uh, not only with Raja and Apple, and Vanita, but also with the amazing cohorts that we've had, you know, we're in our second year and it's been absolutely incredible to meet all these great people. So we're so excited just to keep expanding it and refining and pushing the boundaries of integrative dermatology. This is an incredibly exciting time. And on that note, just to talk about what is integrative dermatology? Well, we want to make a distinction between what we call alternative medicine and what integrative dermatology is because integrative dermatology has the seat of it being conventional medicine as one of the key components. And so uh, we want to draw from, say, whether it's Ayurveda or traditional Chinese or naturopathy or nutrition or say it's mind body or mindfulness. We want to draw from all of these areas, but really make it so that it's also incorporating conventional. And so they're just, we're, we're, you know, you don't want to work with one hand tied behind your back in any sort of way. And so we really try to um, look at the evidence pretty critically and um, look at what studies are out there and then balance that against safety and then put it all together. And so when you're thinking about integrative dermatology, it's not just skin, you know, you're going to be focusing on other things necessarily, you know, like the gut or say the mind or what kind of foods you're putting in, what kind of supplements you might be incorporating. And so there's definitely that inside out, outside in approach. And so um, this, the certificate program is really designed for dermatologists. And I should say it's only available to dermatologists and it's taught by us in dermatology. Um, if you're not a board certified, well, if you're board eligible, that's fine too. But if you're not a dermatologist, um, you're not eligible to be in the program. And it's really for those of you that are dermatologists that wish to grow your skill sets in an effort to provide patients with the full assortment. And we know there's a lot of things that are left out in residency training. Residency training just has so many things, but there's so many other aspects of just treatment that uh, patients ask about and so much emerging literature that you, you I, I can almost guarantee you didn't get to in your residency 
that we try to hit upon. And so that's what this program really is for. It's for dermatologists that wanna take it to the next level. And it'll probably re-energize you about medicine too. And that's like a, a major side effect of this whole um, approach. It's a nine month program. And we're looking at uh, a, a portion where we're looking at the fundamentals. And what does that mean? Well, what does it mean to evaluate the microbiome? What does it mean to look at uh, different functional endpoints? Not only that, what does it mean to be uh, thinking about nutrition? Or how do you uh, incorporate um, the science of herbals and herbal extracts and phytochemicals? And how do you think through that? Or what does it mean to um, think about mindfulness or mind-body approaches? So those are fundamentals. Then they get incorporated into the diseases that we see all the time. And so, you know, atopic derm, acne, psoriasis, vitiligo, they're all going to be incorporated. And then there's another piece in there that's really about the business and entrepreneurship. Say you want to think about building your own brand or think about uh, exploring and um, making something that's new, whether it's in social media or with a practice. Um, we try to give you some of those tools as well, whether it's legal or liability or even beyond that, just um, a camaraderie and uh, an approach to compounding pharmacists all of that so that you can be practical, not just learning, but how you can implement it. And then we put it all together with these in-person intensives, which by the way, once you're part of the program, you can join every single year. And uh, we meet right before the Integrative Dermatology Symposium and we had a blast last time and we have an awesome program planned this time as well. And that's where we get to take a lot of our learning to the next level. So let me um, then transition over to a case. I'll turn it over to Peter. But uh, we wanted to talk about a case very briefly, give you a little flavor for how this works. And then, of course, we'll get into the really good stuff, which is uh, talking about people's experiences. Excellent. Yes, I thought it'd be fun. We'll kind of do this case. And I really want everyone to kind of get involved and talk about it. Great. This is a real patient of mine, but I've changed some of the details. I think it's, I wanted to bring in a couple of different concepts and make a bit of an amalgamation of, of some of the different issues that might come up and why we might think outside of the box. So Raja, you're driving, right? Can I have you yep. go forward? Thank you so much. So this is a 22 year old patient, history of chronic atopic dermatitis, number of recurrent skin infections. And this is a huge problem for patients in my practice where they'll get lots of staph infections, sometimes very superficial ones like impetigo or folliculitis, but sometimes more significant ones from cellulitis. And I even had a patient a number of years ago who actually ended up getting a, a deeper infection and got septic and then threw a clot and had a stroke, all related to atopic dermatitis. Presumably, he had terrible AD and just you know open wounds all over the place, just terrible. Uh, and he was like a football guy, and he had hemiparesis. It was just horrible. Uh, this poor patient is also exhausted from many nights of little sleep or poor sleep. Maybe he gets through the night sleeping, but he is not good quality sleep. And he's always scratching. He wakes up with blood on the sheets. He's also really frustrated because everybody he sees kind of tells him the same thing. Oh, you know, here's some triamcinolone. Hang in there. Use it as much as you need. Like he's feeling like no one's really offering anything except big guns. And of course, people are often offering systemic things like prednisolone as well. And he's a little wary of these. He first developed it shortly after birth. And then by about age six, he was pretty severe. 60% or more of his body, arms, legs, abdomen, hands, abdomen, hands. He's had these staph infections each time he's appropriately been treated with an oral antibiotic. It seems to get worse in the winter. He's kind of bad all year, but winter is particularly rough. And we've talked about the sleep. And one of the things here that I think is fascinating is we talk about absenteeism, right? And that's where you miss school or you miss work. That makes sense. That's easy to track. Um, but another thing that's really complicated is presenteeism. And this is much harder to track. This is, you made it to work. You made it to school, but you weren't all there. You were distracted. You were exhausted. You were overtired, whatever it is, you know? So the problem with that is, you show up, but you're, you're not really showing up. And then we don't get to know that, right? It, from, a, from a system standpoint, it's really hard to capture that concept. Um, should we see what's on the next slide? And then maybe we can, we can start chatting about it. Yeah, we can just kind of do the family history. There is some allergies in the family, asthma, allergic rhinitis. He's had a history of, of maybe asthma when he was little, this kind of reactive air, airway disease diagnosis, but doesn't now have asthma, properly speaking, no known drug allergies and no real seasonal allergies. Like the spring is not a bad time for him. It's really that winter time with the cold, dry air. 
Um, let's see what the next slide shows us, Raja, if we can. Okay, yeah, maybe we'll we'll look through this and then we'll we'll open it up a little bit. So current therapy, I mentioned the triumphs and alone. Everybody's constantly giving them the one pound jar, which is of course like a very reasonable thing to to do because it's cost effective. It works great, but when that's the only thing that's being done, it seems a little bit weird. And he's using it two to three times per day pretty much on an ongoing basis. He also has done wet wrap therapy and he gets some improvement if he does wet wrap for a few nights, but then he's worried, you know, he's worried that he's overusing it. He's played around with the bleach baths. He's trying to understand what the data is on that. He takes a uh, hydroxyzine at night and a satyrazine in the morning. He's using tons of moisturizers. He's the guy who comes in with the big bag of everything. And currently he's not on antibiotics, but I thought maybe we could just kind of, kind of talk about this patient and think about this patient from a couple of different aspects. Um, you know, one thing I think we can maybe play with just a little bit that in a normal derm visit often doesn't get discussed is the behavioral piece too. Absolutely, Peter. Should um, should we open it up to everybody and anybody that's on here? Yeah, anyone want to have some thoughts? I just think it'd be kind of fun because this is, you know, such a common scenario in, in yeah. one way, shape or form, right? It doesn't have to be the same age or the same severity, but so many eczema patients come in and they're sort of undertreated. In fact, the numbers suggest that in adults in particular, probably three out of five patients are undertreated for their atopic derm. This is from independent studies like National Eczema Association, where they really are trying to understand, because I hear it wearing my hat when I'm part of NEA, I'm, I'm a board member and I'm a, now an emeritus scientific advisory committee member, which means I'm old. Um, it's, like, it's like the nicest way to say, congratulations, you're old and it's time for you to leave. You're now emeritus, but I'm really, I'm happy. I feel, I feel glad about that. I've been there for a long time, but we hear just over and over and over, patients just feel so frustrated. So yeah, um, you know, I, I'll kind of start it off, but I'd love for anybody, including our, our attendees to, to jump in and our, in our wonderful panel tonight, everybody, please feel free. Um, the behavioral piece is really huge. And I think is often under discussed. So part of what he, you know, we said, okay, there's no seasonal allergy, fine, but that's only one potential trigger. What about stress? What about his routine in life? You know, because I think that's really important to dig into that. And for some of the patients, I find there's a huge component of stress and they will start instigating scratching behavior, even when they're not itchy. Well, and then they scratch. So then they do itch. Right. So they start cycle. that cycle. That vicious yeah. cycle begins. Yeah. I was um, going to mention, like, I just had actually, because I'm bursting, because I have this patient that just sent me photos today um, of a guy. He wasn't as widespread. He's in his fifties and his eczema has kind of calmed down to really just his hands, but he came in with bleeding and cracked hands. And you know, he's, he kind of th thinks that he's got some steroid resistance because he's been using triamcinol his whole life. And now it's just seems like it just doesn't do the trick as much anymore. He wasn't really clinically impetigenized, but I put him on the Aaron regimen, which I know Peter is near and dear to your heart. Um, and I was showing all of our, my residents today. He had sent me pictures of each week after using the Aaron regimen, which is I dilute mid potency steroid along with mupirocin ointment and you mix it into a pound of um, just a cream. The pa patients can make it on their own. It's 45 grams of a mid-potency steroid like triamcinolone or beta-methasone and then 44 grams of mupirocin. They take it home. I've got a whole thing of how they mix it up and using a spatula and making sure, making really sure that it's well mixed together because it is so dilute. He was putting it on four times a day for the last month and he sent me pic pictures at each week and he's totally clear. And it's the only thing that's gotten him totally clear in many years. And it's one of these things, like, it doesn't seem like it should work because it's so dilute. And, um, but it, it does. And I've seen it over and over, even with really nasty crusted impetigenized eczema, where you're putting the steroid on and then the staph goes crazy and you're struggling to balance that out. This, this just works so well for that. The other thing behaviorally, if you're putting something on, four to six times a day, which is a little, lot. it's a lot. Most people are using something like twice a day. There's a behavioral component with that too, where instead of like scratching, you're like four to six times a day reminded to kind of rub something in gently to the skin, which maybe that's a part of why, how it works. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, yeah, I love the Aaron regime and it, it really does address a number of aspects. There are some great um, comments in the chat. Um, one of which is start with patch testing. I think that's a, a great idea. And one of those things that often gets left behind because it is a little unwieldy 
to, to do and not everybody does it, but that is something that I think is really powerful because if there is a contactant, sometimes even in the Triumph alone or whatever, the moisturizer that can actually change the whole game. And then I see another um, great comment about uh, this from Nadia about oral methotrexate uh, and then maybe eventually going towards dupilumab, a biologic. I think those are extremely good ideas and, and definitely, you know, excellent approach and things we have to offer the patient. Those would be great. And then Catherine just wrote in um, patch testing, uh, consider food allergies and then phototherapy is my usual. I love that. I'm a big fan of phototherapy because I feel that phototherapy kind of walks the line between integrative and conventional, right? You know, we can sort of spin it as really kind of an integrative therapy. It's the power of light. It helps with itch. It helps with inflammation. It helps with the microbiome. It boosts endogenous vitamin D. Like it's, it's kind of awesome. And right. The thing we don't talk about, but is really important too. It's a powerful behavioral change because if you can get someone to come in two to three times a week, they are really invested in getting better. And I say that in not a sketchy, like we're trying to trick them way. I say that in like a real clinician way. Like I think people get engaged and get excited and really take, you know, take this on. And that that's a huge part of getting better. Right. I mean, that's, that's a huge piece. Um, so I love all these things. Now, what about food? I mean, that's a great one. Could food allergens be playing a role? Uh, what do you guys think panel? I, I would, you, if the patient came in talking about food, where would you go with that? How would you counsel them? Peter, I adapted your saying, I say, yes, food is a part of it, but I don't know how much. <laughs> and that is because everyone comes in wanting to do like everyone never wants gluten, never wants to get rid of gluten. So I always tell them I, while I treat them, I'm more than happy to have them try to like get rid of things they think might trigger it. I just explained them like the six to eight weeks and then introduce them back slowly to see and just kind of keep food diaries. But I just tell them it's not like conclusive by any means, but if they want to like explore that, just not get rid of everything at once, but trial certain things at a time while we're treating them with our methods to see how it goes. I love that because you're not dismissing them. Oh, please. Yes. Rada, oh, please. One of the things I was going to say that strikes me about this um, patient is, um, is how um, the lack of sleep and the itch. I mean, those are two terrible things to have to deal with. So I would definitely try to address the itch, like the first thing. Um, the second thing I wanted to point out was because uh, clearly from a psychological standpoint, this has been very distressing to him. He hasn't been sleeping, um, then the itch. Just seeing, a new, seeing somebody else that can kind of offer, like run through the different options and to just let him know that there are these other options that he can get better, I think would already probably just change the perspective of the whole visit and perhaps give him hope. Um, and I've seen that happen many times in my own practice when I see patients that come in and they're like, oh my God, I've done this and I always get a steroid and then it get, doesn't get better. And, and then I just go run through like, well, there's all these things that we can do and we're going to work together to find out what's the best option for you. So um, I just wanted to point that out, that just that initial visit with somebody and kind of laying out a plan for them and uh, trying to target the, uh, the sort of the most uh, pertinent symptoms, I, I believe, would be um, really helpful. I also would, um, I'm looking at this list, he doesn't have anything for maintenance. So um, I would love the idea, Dr. Leo, you taught us this, to, um, your pink magic, vitamin B12, or something like, you know, tacrolimus, um, more, more for maintenance, so he's not always on the transone, helping that to work better for when he needs it, and um, helping him take it into his own hands. I know he's young and all that, but um, as you taught us, the large intestine 11, which is the itch area just above the elbow, you know, either using a pressure point there to help him manage the itch as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. You know, I think uh, one of the things with this kind of a case that you want to think about is are they in a flared state or are they in a maintenance state and how do you keep them maintained? And I think there's two different approaches there. So, you know, and there's two different ways you talk to the patient. So if they're, and this is one of the, the, the frustrations that I think if you just acknowledge this, you've already gotten brownie points is that you tell them, I understand you come in, you get a steroid and then the steroid is just how you get back to your maintenance. And then we wait for you to flare again. And then we give you a steroid. That's kind of the standard approach. Conventional medicine approach is you give them and then you wait. And maybe you even teach them about moisturizers. We don't really teach them about moisturizers like humectants and whether you're using occlusive and the thickness and the viscosity. Like we don't talk about those things in residency, but those are all important. But when you get to maintenance, yeah, vitamin B12, 
oral L-histidine. How do you deal with food allergies? Is it IgG, IgE testing? There's some evidence for some of those. Um, we're even going to do some studies eventually, uh, not eventually, actually upcoming. But it's, um, and then you also have N-acetylcysteine and, uh, and then you also have N-acetyl-L-cysteine now because you can't get N-acetylcysteine anymore because the FDA pulled it. But there's other little uh, ways that we can approach it. So I think this is awesome inside out, outside in, but I just think uh, making sure you know whether they're in a maintenance state or a flared state and acknowledging that they keep bouncing between these states is a really important uh, aspect of care. I was gonna just um, also mention the issue of sleep has come up and um, you know melatonin is a really good anti-inflammatory as well. And so having that discussion, like really focusing on sleep and maybe this isn't something that you talk about at your first visit, um, you know, but I work in a, as many people do in situations where we don't have really long office visits, um, like the kind of integrative um, primary care docs might have. And so I'm seeing people in my academic practice and I maybe have 10 or 15 minutes. So it might not be the first thing we talk about, but certainly early on, you could talk about that importance in the sleep inflammatory cycle um, and, and thinking about kind of melatonin as one thing that can hit both, can help with sleep and then also has some good anti-inflammatory benefits. Now, should we keep moving along? This was an awesome discussion. Perhaps we should keep moving along. And then Catherine, your question about quercetin, that's more of a histamine stabilizer. So, you know, maybe Peter can comment on that really quick, but N-acetylcysteine and N-acetyl-L-cysteine, there's some evidence for that with itch. But, uh... Yes, I totally agree, Raja. I think it is best suited, you know, it really seems to work on that histamine pathway. And one of the, the hardest parts about atopic dermatitis itch is that it really does not predominantly drive the, you know, it's not driven by histamine. So um, it's, it's a different pathway. So they usually are not too effective in this context. And then are there any other tests that any of you would have considered? And this is to the entire panel. Any other things that you would uh, per perhaps pursue? I know patch testing was one that was offered, which is an, an awesome suggestion. Anything else that you might do? I think you could consider a biopsy. I had one case of a young person in their teenage years who was convinced she had eczema, had bi prior biopsies that showed eczema, and it just looked different to me. And I said, do you mind if I biopsy it? And it ended up being cutaneous T cell lymphoma. So, yeah. you know, if you, you know, if you have any suspicion at all, a biopsy could be helpful. Okay. So, you know, we're going to have a lot of good conversations here, but uh, perhaps um, Peter, you can just take us through, you know, what you did and then we can. Found Love it. it. So um, we did a couple other labs or that he came with some labs, uh, including we knew that he had an elevated IgE count and a very high eosinophil count. To me, those are kind of normal. Like we're kind of expecting that for our really atopic patients. So I never quite know what to make of it. Sometimes though, it does upset the allergists that are taking care of them. They get kind of worried. I'm like, I like, yeah, we just see it, you know? So I don't know. It's not, it's not normal, but, um, and they did do some, some um, immunocap testing uh, for him. And it, it was kind of not very helpful. You know, ragweed, Bermuda grass, dust mite. It's sort of like, well, what do we do? He was doing some dust mite um, you know, treatments for the house and had covers and cases. So he, he, we didn't, you know, I don't think he took anything. Um, he, he didn't really, uh, ignore any of the advice, but then we did patch testing. And if you go to the next slide, we had the dreaded angry back. So everything lit up and then it's like, you really can't interpret this. So I was like, Oh man. And to me, I don't have a good way to predict this. It's fairly rare. It's happened to me, you know, a few times over the years, but and when it does happen, it tends to be people that do have a pretty revved up immune system. So we were kind of like, all right, well, we're going to have to be a little bit more empiric now. I definitely think, you know, the skin biopsy would be a thought. Um, other things that I do just in general, if, if it's really abnormal, I will do the celiac panel just to make sure I, I always hate to miss that if it's driving it. I also like to do a thyroid because sometimes there is some, some uh, thyroid issues going on. And then uh, an ANA, you know, I'll do an ANA with a reflex panel just because occasionally there's other stuff that's kind of masquerading. Peter, can so I clarify, he, do you do those things with the angry back syndrome or would you? Do no, just like somebody who's refractory or if they look a little weird, you know, somebody who's not responding to me, the angry back, I think it just happened to anybody. Yeah. 
So here's the hard part with this case. So he kind of came in armed with some information on topical steroid withdrawal and topical steroid overuse. So he is getting worried about the amount of steroids. And maybe this would be a case where I'm thinking about the Aaron regime, you know, the steroid antimicrobial plus the moisturizer. And then all of a sudden he's like, oh, I kind of don't want any more steroids. Um, he's also really interested in getting to the root of the problem and not just putting topicals on in part because they're not serving him, but also because he feels like it's sort of just a, it's just putting a, a little bit of a bandaid on the problem. He wants to do more and they're difficult to apply. So if we go to our next slide, we talked about UVB because I love that too. That came up in the comments. I totally agree. And he was enthusiastic, but he's like, gosh, the closest place is like almost an hour away. Um, so it's like, oof, that's going to be really tricky. So we kind of talked about, should we do home therapy? Should we try to do that? But that, you know, can be tricky if you've never done it. So we thought that yes, dupilumab would be a really good start, um, because kind of had a good balance of things. And we were fortunately able to give him the loading dose right in clinic, which is kind of neat. And then he came back doing much better. And this is where it also is kind of an interesting point. He feels like he's sleeping better. His energy's up, his mood is up. And he says, well, can I come off now? I don't really wanna be on drugs. And this is another spot where I think we can think integratively. And this is another huge part where I, where I used my integrative stuff where I'll say, well, you're not cured, but I truly believe in this concept of remission. For, especially for eczema, uh, where we can get them better for a while, maybe a little longer than two months. I might want them better for like three to six months. But then what I find is that if we stop people, we can keep them in good shape, but we can't do nothing. Usually you can't just say, go back and enjoy the world. So this is a time where we might say, okay, let's pull out all of our stops with our integrative approaches. Maybe our vitamin B12. Can we think about diet now? This is a great time to optimize. Maybe not so much looking for a food allergen or something driving it, but a really anti-inflammatory, really healthy diet? Can we really dig into lifestyle? Do we feel like there are stress things? Can we bring in meditation, hypnosis? Can we think about those aspects? This is another great time also to think about things like acupuncture because acupuncture is not very fast. It's not going to necessarily get somebody out of a tight bind, but boy, it could be part of a holistic approach to getting health and disease in better balance and helping this patient go further. And now that things are, you know, this patient has hours and hours now found per week better sleep and the, the routine is much simplified, you know, than doing all the stuff that they were doing. So I think this is kind of a neat opportunity as well. And I love it because it's very integrative. We did something very conventional state of the art, but then we can also use some integrated. I love the idea that we could be very conventional, but we can continue to think outside of the box too. That's, I think that's a big part of it. When patients say, I just want alternative stuff, I often will say, you know, that's not really what I do, right? I'm a conventional dermatologist. We're trying to integrate these things. So it's going to be both. But for a patient who says that, I'm not going to be mean or dismiss them. I'm just going to say, okay, I have people that I work with. And that's kind of the, the other level of this course. You know, what, what can we do? What can we put in our practical toolbox that we can use and really, you know, get comfortable talking about those, bringing those up and thinking through those. But then when do we might, you know, when do we think it's best to say, look, I'm going to refer you to someone to do traditional Chinese medicine, or I'm going to refer you to an Ayurvedic practitioner, or I'm going to integrate the hypnosis. I, I've been doing that a lot lately. I have a hypnotherapist that I work with in Chicago. She's spoken to us here. Um, Lisa Lombard. She's great. And I've been sending a ton of patients. I just think a lot of patients are really anxious. I don't know. Part of it is like the pandemics hopefully ending. There's like, just, there's a lot of stuff, the war and just all these things. There's just like a lot going on. And I can't tell you how many patients have been so receptive to it. They're like, yes, I need this. And I'm like, great. And I tell, I'm very transparent. I go, you know, I've seen her when I was having panic attacks years ago. And she is incredible for just, rela it's really a form, you know, it's a form of, I think of it just as a formula for relaxing. Anyways, I want to open it up to the group to hear a lot. Well, you know, sometimes when my patient is on dupilumab, sometimes they don't want to go onto it or they want to figure out how do I taper off of it. And it's really hard to taper off of it if you don't have other things that you're going to offer the patient. Because if you just put them on it and you didn't do anything to shift their lifestyle, shift stuff about it. If you come off of it, it's going to flare. So many times I can taper them to like once a month. Um, you know, these are all off, obviously off label kind of uh, approaches, but um, you know, there are supplements that we can talk about. There are even probiotics that you can start considering. And in fact, there are some studies looking at probiotics that you can supplement as during pregnancy or in early childhood that can reduce your rates for atopic germ. So there's a few things in here that we can discuss, even if it's not directly related to this case, but uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think you did a pretty awesome job with it, Peter. And I think really the question is how do you keep them maintained? And many times they don't want to be on a lifelong medication because that's what dupilumab is. It's a lifelong medication. They want something else. And so, you know, we can talk through that. You know, there are some good thinking... questions. Oh, go ahead, Apple. There's questions in the in the chat too. Oh, yeah. And I was going to kind of pipe in a little bit about this gluten issue. You know, everybody's excited to go gluten-free and now we've got good options. And, you know, so many people come in like having gone gluten-free and there is some evidence that people who go gluten-free who do not have celiac disease are at higher rates, higher risk for heart disease. And I think that's because they're missing out on a lot of B vitamins that are found in whole grain foods. So, um, you know, like definitely going through a trial or like Kurt was talking about, I love the food diaries. And it's not like, counting calories and necessarily getting the serving sizes and all of that. It's just kind of keeping track of what you're eating and pairing that with what your symptoms are. So trying to see if you can find a pattern. So it's, it's you know, not looking for specifics, but general patterns. And um, a lot of times when people's guts are really inflamed, um, they might not tolerate the gluten early in the course of a treatment protocol. And especially as they change their diets, as they include more fiber to feed those, that, those healthy gut micro um, bacteria then, um, and kind of help make that gut microbiome healthier, then they can start tolerating more. And, um, there are also things that you can do from a culinary standpoint that help break down gluten before someone eats it. So we kind of think like bread, these quick rising yeasts have not been our friend. You know, they, they allow us to take bread from flour to a nice fluffy loaf in, you know, 30 minutes or an hour. Um, but, things like really traditionally made sourdough breads, that, that, that souring process, that fermentation process helps break down gluten so that it's not as inflammatory of a molecule. And there are some things, there, there's an ancient, ancient tradition of soaking grains. So even before you might try making a sourdough, you can soak the flour ahead of time, or you can soak things like oats or rye or other grains that might have some gluten in them. And in an acidic medium, so like a little bit of lemon juice, or apple cider vinegar um, overnight, and that helps break down some of that gluten as well. And so there, there are people kind of like, oh, I have to give up bread forever. You know, I've got a number of patients that can tolerate like a sandwich a week or something. You know, they have they have their limit, and they figured it out through those food um, food symptom diaries. That that after they get beyond a certain threshold, then they're going to start having problems. But most people have a gluten intolerance, which which is not an allergy, and it's. Um, or gluten sensitivity, not an intolerance. So they can they can tolerate some, and they just need to be careful. Like you know, things like Wonder Bread is going to be a bigger gluten load than um, than something like a sourdough cracker. We should probably um, move on, but I know there's a couple questions. GI map testing for dysbiosis, absolutely. You can do GI testing. You don't only have to do GI map. We actually cover some of these, whether it's 16S whole genome. Um, and you know, people have different preferences, but th there are some things that you can test there to see if they're playing a role. Um, and Peter, you could comment on omega threes. I think it's been, uh, it depends. And, uh, some of the studies have been mixed, but some of them have been promising too. Uh, but perhaps you can comment on that and we'll move on. Yeah. It's so cool. You know, in dogs, it really does seem to help their eczema. Dogs get <laughs> atopic derm <laughs> pretty seriously. I've actually gotten to go to the veterinary dermatology conferences and give lectures and hang out with them. They're super smart. Um, and dogs do, they use the omega threes for dogs a lot. They also use Jack inhibitors. That was the first Jack inhibitor that came out, uh, was actually for dog atopic dermatitis. I think Pfizer made it or something and they sold it so fast that they literally couldn't manufacture it enough. That's how big of a hit it was. And the dogs tolerate it well, apparently, but just like the human version, it's really hard to come off. But anyways, that being said, um, omega-3s are often used. They do seem to help in humans. It's mixed. Um, definitely, I think borage oil and evening primrose oil, both which are really rich in omega-3s, they seem to help. There's actually a wonderful study on hemp seed oil, which has a lot of omegas as well. And that really does suggest it, but it's a little mixed. I often do it uh, as a supplement as well for patients. I think it, it's one of those things kind of like vitamin D where it's maybe hit or miss, but overall, I do think there's our super responders, patients that do great with it. And it, you know, super cheap, super, super safe. So I'm not worried about trying these things on patients. I think it's great. Although fascinatingly, if you look at the Cochrane review, they actually specifically call out evening primrose and borage oil as being things that don't have 
that have enough evidence to say they don't work and we shouldn't be talking about them anymore. But when we did an independent re-review, I'm like, this is weird. It's not true at all. There's a whole bunch of studies. It's actually much more balanced, in fact. So I, I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, well, the Cochrane review also said that Accutane doesn't work for acne. So let's just keep everything. <laughs> right. That, that's so crazy. All right. So the 2022 Integrative Dermatology Symposium is upcoming, and that is where our intensives are going to be. It is in awesome Tucson. I think that's the official adjective, by the way, that's used. It's awesome Tucson, Arizona. And uh, you can already see from here that um, we're going to be zenning out when we're there, but we'll also get our learning on. Remember that early bird and July 15th. But if you are in the IDCP, you are already registered and you're going to be locked and ready to go for this. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the dermatologist cohort. Um, so before we get into like the discussion panel, which we'll move into pretty quickly, we have a pretty wide ranging uh, cohort. And um, you can see they come from all parts of the United States, whether it's West, Central, East. We have some international students. That number actually went up with this cohort. We just haven't pulled the numbers for this year um, and put it all together. But the, the, uh, the point is that we get a pretty diverse population. It's not just the coasts. We get people from like Alabama. We get people from uh, the, the middle of the country. I mean, everybody is thinking about integrative. And so some of the things that the graduates have said is that I've learned new things I've never known before practical and evidence-based, and they're more excited. And this is the part that really gets us, um, I think, uh, passionate, is that they're more excited about practicing dermatology. So let me introduce each of the alumni. Uh, I'll, I'll, I won't introduce them, but I'll let them introduce themselves. And then we'll get into some Q&A questions. And then if you have any questions, please put them into the chat, and that would be fantastic. All right, so um, Stacy, if you can introduce yourself, and we'll just go down uh, the list here. Hi everyone, um, my name is Stacey McClure. I finished my dermatology residency at Northwestern in 2006. So I've actually been out a while and practiced for a while and just kind of felt compelled to do this for a variety of reasons. Um, family issues that didn't get consolved with conventional means kind of introduced me to the whole integrative approach and um, led me to the group. Thanks Stacey. You wanna go ahead, Steven? Sure thing. I'm Steve Dave Louie. I am the program director for the program here at Wayne State in Detroit, Michigan. Um, so I'm kind of one of the academicians who came and, and did the program and I'm hoping to kind of incorporate it into our residency program into the future. So we can train a whole new generation of residents who are more aware of these other options. Um. Hi, I'm Radha Michelinani, and I did the uh, certificate program uh, the first year. Uh, it came out in 2020, and I did it primarily because I've been interested for a long time in looking at uh, different ways of sort of treating patients, um, different methods. And, you know, I think as dermatologists, we, we often do that. We compound items. We think outside the box. We, you know, think, well, how about we use this medicine for that disorder, even though it's not FDA approved for that. I mean, this is sort of what we do. So it really struck me as something that uh, would really enhance my practice. And, you know, the, ti the timing was right uh, because I was stuck at home <laughs> during the pandemic. So I'm really happy I did it. And I've stayed in touch with the group and I've definitely incorporated a lot of what I've learned. And um, I will tell you that uh, I think we're all lifelong learners and I am still learning. <laughs> so. Thanks, Radha. I'm Kurt Ashak. Um, I'm fairly fresh out of residency. I graduated in 2020. I'm in private practice in Michigan. Um, kind of like everyone else, I I was interested in this course in general just because, like, I do a lot of things myself. Try to like you know outside of like Western medicine, or try to like integrate like you know different things if I get like an injury from sports or things like that. And then also just like I was finding like in residency, and then like as I got out, the more and more of my patients were wanting to understand why and not just wanting a treatment. And I just found that like, I didn't know a lot to like help them. And then I found this course on the Facebook group and I was interested in it, um, came to this last year. And then ever since then, it's been an amazing experience. I'm starting to integrate more things and I feel like I'm really gonna be able to help out my patients more. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the Q and A. All right, so we'll jump into some questions. I was just gonna say, Steve, that your residents are gonna be woke after this, <laughs> if you get to integrate with them. 
All right, so we have some questions for the for the group. And by the way, anyone attending, if you have questions too, please swing them into the into the chat or into the Q and A se section. We'll uh, get to them. So um, I think you all gave us a little bit about your background, but maybe you can tell us why you decided to join the IDCP. What was it that maybe needed to change, or you wanted to grow about you? You know, however you want to answer that question, and you know, maybe you know a couple of you can take this one. Sure, I'll go ahead. Um, so uh, I decided to join because I think like Kurt was saying, I found that my toolbox wasn't big enough and patients were coming in asking me, don't you have anything else? Don't you have something that's not a steroid or something more natural? And I knew some stuff, but I didn't know enough evidence-based to be able to speak on it you know, appropriately. So this course has really helped me to do that. I feel much more confident in talking with patients and I have a much bigger toolbox of which to treat my patients with, which is really awesome. So I too you know, thought at the beginning, well, can I do this? Do I have enough time? I know we're all so busy. Um, some of you have kids, I have younger kids, um, you know, we're busy. And I thought, how am I gonna do this? And it's, it's very doable, so doable. So I'm very happy I, I, I did it. I'm able to incorporate this for my patients on a daily basis. Um, and really in 15 minute appointments, you can incorporate this talking, even if it's just one thing, just about diet or nutrition or a supplement. Um, and it's been great and the patients have been super receptive. And my interest, I, I sort of, like everybody was saying, I, I, these things kept coming up and I kept wondering more and wanting to know more, but wanting to do it through our sort of Western lens of, I want the evidence, you know, I'm not going to recommend some essential oil just because a patient told me it worked well. I want to see that there's evidence for it. Um, and I attended the Integrative Derm Symposium first, and that kind of got my feet wet and pulled me in because then it was like, oh my gosh, there is evidence. And there are people who know the evidence and who are passionate about studying these things and actually going forth with evidence-based recommendations for them. Um, so that kind of got my feet wet. And then I said, all right, I need to learn more. I need more of it. And um, yeah, it's been really great. Thanks, everyone. But maybe I can go on to the next question, unless any, uh, like Kurt and Radha, did, I don't know if you wanted to jump in on this question. I mean, I think I, I, I answered this a little That's bit, true. but um, but I would agree with, with uh, you know, Steve and Stacy exactly the same. I mean, patients come in all the time. I also was really frustrated with some of the traditional treatments because um, sometimes they weren't working, right? And, and I don't think that there's, you know, one size fits all. So to be able to, as Stacy put it, have an expanded toolkit, uh, it's it's been really great, um, and and to be able to speak uh, knowledgeably about these questions that patients come in with about this herbal treatment or that, or or now to even think about, well, I'm going to send this patient to a nutritionist because I do think that their psoriasis might, while I can help them on this end, you know, maybe somebody assessing their diet. Um, or, you know, sending them to a therapist for, you know, mental help or whatever it is, it, I, I sort of feel much more confident bringing that into the dialogue with the patient. I think that's changed my practice in really positive ways. All right, well, let's go to the next question. Um, and I think so, a couple of you had questions in the chat, but I think the, um, there's uh, some responses coming back to you there. Uh, so next question, how has IDCP changed your clinical approach with their patients? You said you incorporate this every day and, uh, you know, even in 15 minute visits. So maybe, uh, you know, Kurt, we can start with you, but how has it changed your clinical approach? Completely changed my whole approach because now I can talk to people with a lot more knowledge base on, I think probably the biggest thing I focus a lot on with patients is diet, depending on the condition. I feel like a lot more comfortable and like knowledgeable about some of the stuff we've talked about in the course with diet. Um, but then even just like, you know, taking the time to like, I mean, we always talk about like, you know, the psychological component of things, but I feel like in residency, you kind of get sidetracked away from that and just kind of focus on efficiency. But I feel like asking patients more about the itch, how does it disrupt them? How does it disrupt their social life? And then trying to come up with like, you know, other ways other than just like my topical steroids to help them break the itch scratch cycle while I'm also treating them. Um, or like when they come in with eczema, thinking that it's from gluten and meeting them halfway and like talking to them about, you know, trialing the diet. And I feel like just like acknowledging 
some of these things, I'm actually getting a lot more like trust and buy-in from the patients. And they're willing to try these things because being newer, I'm getting those people that are on their like fifth dermatologist and Hey, I've been doing all these things and I have nothing else. Can you offer something new? And now I can be like, I do. We can talk about your diet and like, you know, just, I always throw the information out there first, um, tell them what I know, see if they're interested over the next couple of visits. And then just kind of like, you know, I've established some relationships with nutritionists that I'll refer my psoriasis patients to, um, naturopaths that I'll, you know, kind of work up in terms of like the gut dysbiosis stuff. And so I feel like it's actually brought in my, um, approach with patients like exponentially. And to echo what Kurt said, I did not fully appreciate how many of the times that a patient is asking you about one of these things. And they're actually sort of putting their feelers out to see how you're going to respond. And I probably used to just shut it down like, oh, yeah, there's not evidence on that. And you move on. But when you can have the conversation, it really does build this new trust where they they feel comfortable sharing with you anything that they've been thinking about or heard about, because you're not going to just shut it down. You're going to talk about you know, where the evidence is. And yeah, those things might be helpful. Whereas, you know, if it wasn't part of your training so far, you just go, oh, I don't really know anything about that. Let's move on to what I do know. And they, they kind of secretly shut down a little part that could be a part of your relationship. Um, I've also found it's been super helpful. I see a lot of hydradenitis separativa, which can be really difficult to get under control. So it has added so many tools for me to be able to talk to patients and make these more connections and talk about mind body medicine and handling the stress of the disease and sort of just kind of taking a different angle when I'm kind of stuck with medications, but that doesn't mean I don't have anything to offer you at this point. We can still sort of talk about, you know, coping strategies or breathing techniques or, or other things that can sort of help you deal with your disease, even when it's, we're having a hard time getting it under control. And that's just been really great. And it just, patients love it. Like they really feel like you care deeply about them and not just writing them a new prescription for the most expensive biologic to, to help the pharma industry. Um, so it's it's been awesome for expanding that part of the practice too. I honestly do not think that, I, I would hate to go back to where I was before this program because I feel like I, would be lost really without the background this program has brought for me. Patients will come in with bags of stuff and they'll want to know, hey, does the, what do you think of this shampoo? What's this? And now I understand how to look at things and, and look at the ingredient list and understanding what they all mean. I, I didn't have any background in any of that at all, but Steve is right. There's so many aspects to somebody's care of skin. It's not just, here's a prescription. We're looking at so many different aspects and when you can help them with all those different avenues and it's evidence-based, that's what's really changed it for me. And um, I definitely think patients appreciate it so much. I've had so many people hug me and thank me and say, you know, wow, I have never met a dermatologist like you and it's been great. Um, I've been kind of fortunate because I um, get to spend more time with my patients typically. So it's been a really nice way of incorporating um, kind of looking at the patient holistically when they do have a condition. And it's uh, and it uh, it just allows, as the other um, panelists had said, um, just a, a better, more cohesive doctor patient relationship. And I would agree that I've had you know similar comments as to, you know, regarding um, my approach being, sort of uh, 360 degrees rather than just focusing on giving them a prescription for whatever is in front of me and rushing through. Um, so that's, that's, been, that's been really great for me. All right, well, that was awesome. So then let's, let's move to this next question. What were the highlights of this program for each of you? I'll take that one, that's super easy. I loved meeting everybody in the program. So <laughs> the cohort that I was with, the faculty, <laughs> and the second cohort as well. So that was really the highlight. It's such a great group of people. I have to say it exciting to meet everybody in person. I thought that was really fun uh, at the uh, IDS. That was terrific. <laughs> I love the going to the intensives. Of course, that was a major highlight and meeting all of you and making those connections. I think one of the biggest things for me is not feeling alone. I feel like 
here I was in my practice and I'm saying so excited about something that I read and nobody seemed to be that excited about it. <laughs> I was excited about it. So getting to meet all of the people that we're talking with today and forming these relationships and knowing that you're not alone. I feel like we're on the cutting edge of, of dermatology and helping our patients. So the highlight is all of, all of you. One of the other highlights for me was improving my own health. Like as you're going through the, the program, it's, it's rare that you go to any sort of educational activity and you come home with something that you're going to do because we're used to learning about, you know, bullous pemphigoid and eczema and I don't have those. So I'm not really going to take anything for myself from it. But with this program, there's so many things that you learn about diet and mindfulness and, you know, stress relief. And even, even some of the, the topicals, like I know Kurt said, like all, everybody in his office is using pumpkin seed oil now topically. Like you just learn these things that you can apply to your life and it helps, it kind of helps you on your own little wellness journey to being healthy, but also you get to then speak from experience and tell patients like, yeah, it would be great if you could try to cut the dairy out. I know it's not easy. I still struggle with cheese, but I'm almost there. And it gives you that connection with people. Um, so that that was a really great highlight too, is sort of not only learning about it and helping patients, but kind of going through this and feeling like, all right, I'm, I'm getting healthier myself. I love it. Yeah, I agree with that as well, Steve. Just, well, I'm using pumpkin seed oil on my face too, and it's awesome. So I definitely like it. My wife's even taking pumpkin seed oil, so it's good. Um, but yeah, just I think, yeah, like you said, just I'm doing all these things myself in addition to telling my patients, and then I can like chat with them about it when they come in, trying the Chardonica powder to knock out your taste buds so you can curb your carb intake. Apple's got me counting my fiber every single day and I'm telling patients, we gotta get rid of the toxins. And so just, yeah, there's so many highlights. I, honestly, like it's it's sad that we're done. I wish we could just keep taking the course over and over, but the intensives were the my favorite for sure, just because we get to meet everyone in person. and. Um, I mean, now we're, we continue to stay in touch too. And it's just nice to be around like-minded people that get excited about the same stuff. Yeah. Now, now I can't wait till next IDS. This is, this is pretty awesome. I mean, I already couldn't wait, but now I definitely can't. How has the IDS, uh, IDCP influenced you in collaborating with other integrative healthcare professionals? Um, I would say that for me, it's really helped because uh, I think going through the program made me realize how you really need a team. It's like a team effort and you can't do everything. I mean, I, if somebody really needs a new, you know, diet, um, change, dietary changes or um, therapy, or maybe they need acupuncture, um, uh, maybe work with an Ayurvedic practitioner or hypnotherapist. So I've actually been able to uh, find um, collaborate, collaborators. You know, I, I've sort of met people, um, you know, just through, just here in New York through the grapevine and talk to, talk to, you know, had referrals um, from other doctors to people who are good. And that's been great. I actually think that that helps the patients too, because the patients really do typically uh, go to who you recommend. <laughs> so, um, so, so I think they, they recognize if they're interested in, um, in getting, you know, getting the sort of the holistic approach and care, then they, they all, They'll go ahead and meet with that nutritionist or go ahead and try acupuncture. And they're, they're quite open, um, my patients. So I love that. I think too, some of these avenues I hadn't even known had any evidence based behind it, you know, with acupuncture or I had never even heard of Ayurveda, but I think once you take the course and once you understand the different avenues, you're going to search those people out. I know I have, I've found oncologists who do integrative, more diet, um, and lifestyle approaches to help minimize the side effects for the chemo that they're giving their patients, but also improve their outcomes. So just simple things like that and understanding that part of it helps you collaborate with other practitioners and, you know, building that network, you know, makes better care for patients. Yeah, I agree with that before yeah. too, but yeah, I work with a nutritionist now. Um, so anyone that's interested in talking about the diet, I have someone I can refer them to a naturopath that, you know, before I kind of felt comfortable working on the stool testing, I would send them to them um, just to kind of do like the, you know, GI map and whatnot and kind of go over treatment for that. Um, and then I'm just, I, I kind of look for like other practitioners in the area to work with, which is kind of struggling in the West Michigan area. But um, 
it's nice to kind of at least know where we can look. We get the websites that we can look for these practitioners in our areas too, which is helpful. You know, I also think as MDs and DOs, we're sort of, you know, sort of really into the sort of allopathic path. And one thing that I learned during um, the course was just learning about other paths, you know, so learning about the naturopathic side of things and not, and actually thinking about it, you know, seriously and, and recognizing that, that, you know, they go through a lot of training, they do have a different approach, um, but it's something that I needed to learn about and not maybe judge and um, without any knowledge and same with functional medicine. Well, I think that segues really nicely into this last question. What advice do you have for incoming dermatologists? Um, I'll start out. So I, I, I would just tell anyone who's interested, go for it because this course is amazing. Um, I wish I could do it again, as Kurt said. <laughs> um, just the camaraderie and everything has taught me so much um, going through it. Um, it, you know, you can do this. It is not overwhelming. You'll still have your life. Um, you know, just, I would keep up with the lectures and all of that. Everything is really well done, um, evidence-based. Everyone is easy to communicate with. And so just be open to doing it. And, you know, you will find yourself having, you know, just a much better career and relationship with your patients and with other people and things that you didn't even know existed. Like I said, Ayurveda or some of these other herbal things that I had no idea about. Um, there's a whole world open. So I would just say, jump in. Yeah. And I would say the same thing. It's, it's, it seems like kind of a big time commitment, but it's really not. It's, a, you know, an hour or two on the weekend, and then make sure you set aside the time to do the round table each week, because those are really great. And that's where you really hear new things, talk about everything from that week and from whenever, and you get to really like build those relationships and kind of forge your, your group and your community. Um, make sure you can attend the intensives because they are awesome. And that's where it's really fun to be able to get together with our little tribe in person and, and talk about these things and kind of build connections. And you get, there's like a really good energy there where everybody is excited and, and you end up talking about the things that you might do. And then that might inspire someone else for what they might do. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm like Stacy, I'm type A. So I stayed on top of everything each week and I tried to make sure I was always caught up with everything, which worked really well for me. Even if you can't keep up with the stuff, still go to the roundtable discussion. You're not going to, it's not like they're going to call on you and ask, quiz you or anything. Like just go and you'll still pick things up. <laughs> yeah, there are no quizzes at those roundtables. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with everyone else that if you have an interest in learning more um, about integrative dermatology in an organized way, um, you should do the course. And uh, I also think you should think a little bit about what you want to get out of it in terms of how do you want to practice it in the future. So, you know, one of the things about um, approaching, derm you know, skin disease in this manner is that it does take time. So I think you have to kind of look at the kind of practice you have now and then think about the kind of practice that you might want to evolve into. So how are you going to use it practically um, in the future? And so that... Uh, it may just be that, you know, you just have, have, have this knowledge now so you can advise your patients better, or it may be that you want to build out, you know, a, a full-on integrative practice. And there's lots of different ways to go about doing that, which again, you'll learn more about in, in the course because I think there's some coverage of some of that, uh, the business side of things. And then Kurt, if you want to take this and then there's a question, maybe you can incorporate it as well. What is the typical amount of time you have for a patient visit? Yeah, so I guess like everyone else, like if you're considering it, I would definitely just, I would take the class just because, I mean, I feel like you wouldn't regret it at all. We learned so much um, with respect to the time for patient visits, not as much. I mean, I, I do 15 minute patient slots and um, sometimes even less than that, depending on how many patients I have in a day. But still, even in my small visits, sitting down and listening to the patient and then also like, you know, mentioning some of the things I learn each week and not like, you know, not bombarding them with every single thing. I just learned about eczema, but just like casually throwing out a few things, seeing if the patient's interested in it, 
um, or if they even come in with their list. I just had someone the other week came in, they had a Dutch test written down and asked me if it was useful. And I actually knew what a Dutch test was now, whereas like a year ago, I would have had no idea. Um, but yeah, I mean, just definitely jump in. And then one thing with this screen pull up too, I'll mention is just as a you know newer practitioner coming out and solving debt and whatnot, I saw like the, the price for the tuition and I was concerned, but I broke it up over the, you know, the installments and it was very manageable and um, still definitely worth all the money we spent for it. So uh, on that note, just remember the application uh, is due by April 25th and we start on May 9th. We really do try to make this practical. I mean, Peter and Apple can maybe just kind of finish up here with a few comments, but we try to make it as practical as possible. I see patients in a 15 minute slot and we just incorporate and you really don't need that much time to be integrative. It's a fallacy to think you need hours and hours of time. Um, but you'll touch upon a lot of these different sort of uh, approaches. You get lectures, roundtables, and the intensive. So we really hope that you're part of the next uh, cohort and um, look forward to seeing all of you. And then we can go influence other people. So that's the, uh, that's the goal. Yes, I just like to kind of close by saying that one of our hidden agendas is to build this community. And I'm pretty pleased with what we've done so far. We've had these incredible people come through who are clearly going to stay involved and keep building and adding. And in some ways, I want to be going to their conferences, your all's conferences. I want to learn from you. And it's already beginning. So this is so exciting that we finally are building this uh, momentum to really build a community here. And I kind of feel the same, you know, I was, I was reflecting on it because we just, you all from this current cohort graduated recently, and I was just feeling like how much excitement I felt listening to all of the graduates and what their plans were and what they, and it's very wide, you know, some people have practices like Radha where you have more time and you've built it to be a like really more comprehensive integrative visit each time and other people like Kurt and like me in academics and Steve, you know, I don't have that, that it's a little more tricky. And I do see patients in 15, sometimes I can get a 30 minute appointment um, for some patients, but it's just, you can, like Kurt said, you introduce things slowly and over time, it's that relationship building that I think um, lends itself well to either type of practice. So you don't have to go and change your practice and, um, you know, and put a waterfall in your office. I have, you know, we were joking about the different practices that the three of us each have. And like in mine, we have a poster about whole foods, plant-based diet in the bathroom. <laughs> That's about the only thing you'll see. And, um, but the content is really what's there and the, the spirit behind it and the kind of connections you can make with your, with your patients. And, and, I agree. It's, it's like, I'm just so excited to see all of the graduates take what, what Peter and Raja and I have put together and like take it to the next level and to take the, you know, this knowledge that we've worked really hard at building and kind of trying to forage a, a conduit for this information to make it much so much easier to dispense and to build community around it and to just watch you guys kind of springboard off and do amazing things with it. And I would love for, for, you know, more people to come and more people to experience it for themselves, for self-transformation, and also to transform the way you touch your patients and your colleagues. And on that note, we want to thank all of you for taking your time today to just learn a bit more. Um, and then, you know, the website just got posted. Cynthia, we got your question. We'll get back to you about that and uh, we'll see, you know, uh, what information we can get for you. And um, good night to everybody. And we hope to see you on May 9th. <laughs>